Ron Line Report, everybody. We have a very special guest today. No, he's not an eight-time Mr. Olympia, but you all know this man. Big Mike Cox from the boards. Mike has been on this board since the very, very beginning. In fall of 2006, uh, I believe. Also very popular over at Get Big and Muscle Mayhem back in the day, Mike. Is that right? Well, Muscle Mayhem, dude. That was one of the best forms ever. Okay. Ever. So this is someone I've always wanted to... Uh, you know, see the man behind the myth, the man behind all the posts. So this is our chance to get to know Mike a little bit. Mike, Dude, this, all this, I know really about you is you're from Cleveland, you're in Florida now. Tell me about how you originally got into lifting and bodybuilding. All right, true story. In seventh grade, we had a science fair project. And me and my friends did it on the muscles of the human body. My best friend at the time, his dad had all these old muscle and fitness. And so we're cutting out pictures for the other magazines for our little poster board. We copied word for word from the encyclopedia. Most people probably don't know what an encyclopedia is. Yeah. But um, I was just fascinated by that look. And the first pictures I saw were from the 85 Olympia. Hmm. So I'm cutting out pictures of Gaspari, Beckles, DeMay, Haney, John Brown. And after that, it just snowballed, man. Um, I got hooked. I started borrowing his muscle and fitness. Um, my parents, I asked them for a subscription of Flex in 87, okay? So um, I had a subscription of Flex since 1987, still have it to this day. Yeah. Um, so it, I wasn't going to compete, though. I was just into the sport, into working out. I played football, basketball, baseball. So I wanted to get bigger for that. But what happened was I got the Flex with Sean Ray on the cover yeah. And yeah. after the Nationals. Had that big ass trophy he was holding, um, and at that point I'm like, "This is what I'm gonna look like." I was hooked. I want to get on stage, and this was like '88 because remember, the magazines were like three months behind. Yeah, yeah. So this was probably like, you know, '80 what was say '88 or so. So I was in high school still, first year of high school. Um, still played football, um, played basketball, but after basketball was over, I said, "Screw it, I'm done." Um, and at that time, there was an ad for the 89 Auto Classic. Hmm. Um, and I, being from Cleveland, Columbus is two, only two hours away from um, Columbus. Yeah. So I asked my parents, can we go? And um, I went to that show because Sean Ray was supposed to compete. And so, I, you know, back then we had no social media. We didn't know he was not going to do the show. Right. So I didn't know until I got the program. <laughs> so I'm, we had to, in the very last row of the vet watching Gaspari, Robbie Robinson, Stridham, Bob Paris. And um, it was just one of those experiences, man, to where you wanted to just to do it. I wanted to be on that stage. I wanted to, to get that accolade from the crowd. And six months later, in October of 89, I did the first show, the Team Mr. Cleveland, and it was the biggest rush I've ever had in my entire life. I died on whole eggs, rice, and baby food. Because at the time, Gaspari was eating baby food. They had articles about baby food, so it was good enough for them. Screw it. And it was the rush that you get from posting on stage, man, and the crowd. I got fourth, but I was hooked. I was hooked, man. And from 89 to, like, 93, as, as, as a teen, I did, like, two and three shows a year. You know, I studied the magazines. I set up a, birth, a birthday present I wanted was the Olympia tapes. So every year I got the 88, 89, 90, 91 tapes of the Olympia. And I must have watched those tapes run until they, like, faded. It was ridiculous. Yeah. And, of course, with American Muscle Magazine, which you did, yeah. that was, like, our Bible, mm -hmm. man. You know what I mean? And I would set my VCR to come on at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yes. So yeah. I set the, <laughs> set the VCR to tape that, and it was just – I caught the tail – the beginning of a very magical era. Yeah. I was in the right place at the right time in the right city, and it just snowballed. It snowballed from there, man, and, you know, you have that love for the sport. You know, I don't go to very many shows now anymore, but, like, you know, talking to you right now and meeting Peter last year, my bodybuilding bucket list is getting smaller and smaller, dude. This is just – it's surreal. I was texting Goon earlier, and um, he understands the fanboy part of this. You know what I mean? So he was like, man, I was like, my head spin. I didn't sleep good last night. It was like the day before Christmas. So it's unreal, man. But I love this shit. You know what? I want you to explain to people because we came up before the internet and it was all magazines, really. What was it like being a fan back then compared to what you think it's probably like now for these guys that are young and, and just starting to find out about the sport now? They don't get it. They don't. 
back then, bodybuilders had a certain mystique about them. We didn't see them every day. Um, Jose's in Aruba. I would have never known that 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. Every three months we had to, every month we had to wait. Had to wait three months for a contest to come out. And these guys had such an aura about them. If you didn't live in a city where you had bodybuilders, now you being out in LA, I'm sure you saw a lot of, a lot of bodybuilders at the time, or guys in Boston. But I was in you know Cleveland, Ohio, and Toledo, Ohio. So we didn't have that many you know pro bodybuilders. I had Jim Momney was the only pro that I was around wow. back then. You know he was a, a band away, but Jimmy was still big. Right. You know right. powerlifting champion. But you had to go to a show or see him guest pose or a seminar to really interact with these guys. And I, and I think now guys are spoiled. They want it right now. How many times are you doing a contest report on, at a show and somebody's bitching about where are the picture's at? Where are the picture's at? Every time. Every time. You know what I mean? It, it drives me up the wall because I would have killed to have a – you know, instant report of like the 88 night of champions. You know what I mean? I had to call Wayne DeMillion's office a few times to find the results for a show. Yeah. Or call yeah. Gold's Gym in Venice yeah. or that 1-900 pump in the back of Muscle Mag to get the results for, for a show. You know, it, it's just I don't think people can really appreciate how big and how good these guys are now because you see them so often. Right. You know, pictures – can't really give you a true estimation of how thick these guys are. I saw Jose two years ago down here at a seminar, and you don't want to just stare at these guys like they're in a zoo, but he's so big. You know, at the time, I'm thinking, you know, I'm growing, I'm pretty big. Yeah. And I stand next to him, and I look like a bantamweight. So I have a lot of respect for these guys because it's not easy to do. Yeah. These are the genetic elite. And guys online, when, you, when they say, oh, so-and-so sucks, or he's got a gut, or... He's late because Brandon Curry was so lazy before. And now he's, you know, top of the heap. Yeah. But it's not easy. You know, these guys are all genetic great. You know, I'm at a point to where, like, I'll never step on stage at the Olympia. I'll never be at the Arnold Classic. It's a huge difference between where we're at, you know, and to where they're at. Right. The size is mind-blowing. I would go to the Arnold, you know, every year um, and go to the Expo. And you're just sitting there looking at these guys. I remember looking at Dennis James. I just stopped. His triceps must have stuck out this far from his arm. <laughs> and you can't get yeah. that on a video or a yeah. picture, man. You can't <laughs> grasp that. You know, I saw Tony Freeman one time, and his rear delts, I've never seen rear delts like this before. I'm just, I shake my head, and it, it humbles you. Yeah. This sport will humble you in a second. You know, I just think with social media, yes, it's great because I get to see instant access of, of the guys, get to see what they're looking like during their prep. But it also gives you know, a form for idiots to tell them how much they suck. Yeah. Phil Heath sucks. He sucks six times in a row. Yeah, definitely. You know I mean? So these guys don't suck. They're all great. It's just you have to – I have a lot of respect for what they do because I know it's not easy. You know what I mean? I know doing a national show isn't easy. Those guys are the best of the best, man. And I just wish people would kind of sit back and stop being so angry and so negative about – all these guys, you know, I mean, Dallas started a shit storm, yes. you know, all that stuff that happened yeah. and everybody jumped on the bandwagon. But six months ago, everybody was his best friend when him and Matt are posting their daily routines. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Phil Heath was the prize jewel of the sport in 2011. Now he sucks. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? It's just fans are fickle now. You yeah. win three or four show, three or four Olympias, they want a new champion. Right. Happens every every time there's a multiple Mr. Olympian winner. Yeah. It happens, man. So I think that we just had – we witnessed something great that a lot of these guys will never experience. You know, studying the magazines, reading Peter McGuff's contest report and flex over and over and over again, man. It's just – it was special. And I still have hundreds of flex and muscle fitness and MD, women's physique world, all that stuff. You know what I mean? Still at my mom's house. Yeah. We're just sitting in crates because it was just – I saved all that. You know, and I just – you kind of wish some of these guys could actually see a pro show in person and sit up close to see what I saw. You know, in Tampa, Roman Fritz was posing right next to me. Yeah. And just looking at him thinking, what the fuck, man? He was just so shredded and so hard that it's hard to fathom your human body looking like that. But it's a freak show. And I love the freak show, man. I just love it, you know? Now, you, you and I, again, with no internet, there wasn't as much information available to us about 
training, nutrition, you know, basically we would read things in the magazine and try to cobble our own programs together out of that. Can you recall some of the, I don't want to say the dumber things, but some things looking back that in your early years of training and nutrition that you look back now, why did I do that? What was I thinking? You know, the first routine I ever copied was Rich Kaspari's arm routine at 16. Mm -hmm. It had like 25 sets for biceps, 20 for triceps. Sure. I was sore as hell. I'm thinking, why are my arms not growing? Right. And I just, I followed, we didn't know. I didn't know, you know, I just thought, well, Gaspari's doing it, Sean Ray's doing it, why not, I'll do it. Yeah. So you would read, read all the routines in the magazines and read their diet and try to emulate that, not knowing that these guys are so far advanced. This isn't a 16-year-old program, you know? Yeah. All the weeder stuff, I kept weeder in business with all the stuff I bought. Mega Mass 4000, the hot stuff, the Dibinkin side, boron, zinc. Smilex. You know, yeah. <laughs> yes, Smilax, Vanadel Sulfate. All, we all tried that stuff just to get that edge. But as far as the training, it's funny because when Haney was winning, we all were doing like, you know, the bent over rolls with our back flat. Yeah. As soon yeah. as Dorian comes along, everyone in the gym is doing reverse grip, bent rolls. Standing up like this. Yes. <laughs> Standing just like that. Yeah. Not even using good form, just using as much weight as we can. Training like two and three sets per body part, doing the heavy duty stuff. And here comes Ronnie. We're all doing parking lot lunges. It's monkey see, monkey do. Yeah. It has been for years, man. Once something popular takes over, then everybody follows suit. But when you're young, especially back then, we had no real point of reference, man. We just read what we, we read the magazines and did what they did. And I probably wasted so much time from like 16 to 21 competing a lot, doing too many sets training too often, not recovering. I wasted so much time, man, but you learn your body. You know what I mean? I, I always have done my own prep, even at like 16, 17, but it was just trial and error. You know, dieting on like tuna and broccoli five, six times a day because some whack job in the gym told me this is how you get lean. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, it bothers your mind at all the time that you spent doing stuff that was counterproductive to growing. You know what I mean? And, but you live and learn. I, I wouldn't have changed a thing because it brought me to where I'm at this day. Yeah. You know what I mean? All the experiences I've had in the sport um, and in life, bring, I'm at a good point in my life now. So, but it was just, you shake your head now thinking, man, what was I thinking? I, Mega <laughs> Man 4000 tasted like crap. Yeah. So I, I mixed it with milk and ice cream because I needed the calories to grow. And I think people should know, you started out competing as a lightweight, correct? Dude, I was I was lighter than that. I think in my first show, I was like 135 pounds. Wow. My very first show. My first open show was 95. I was 152. Hmm. I won the um, lightweight and overall. Yeah. And it was Dave Lieberman's show, the Ohio Governor's Cup. It was my hmm. first show, like I said, in the open. I was in college, um, and I just dieted. That was the tuna and broccoli diet that I did because <laughs> the guy in the gym told me to do it. Yuck. But I was in the best shape I've ever been in. I was lean, but I was small as hell. Dude. It was just ridiculous how emaciated I looked. But you didn't. I didn't take those early shows. I didn't appreciate those early shows. You know what I mean? Winning shows back then was like, oh, great. I want to go to the gym and show my trophy off. <laughs> like now when you look back thinking, well, I won my class to Ohio at 23. Wow. That was kind of cool. Yeah. You know, you kind of wish you would have taken it in more. And appreciate it because when you get older, all you got is your memory. So I'm at that old man in the gym talking about my past glory, you know, the <laughs> Ohio and the USA back in 98. And it was just, it was surreal, man. It's just, it was a fun time to be involved in the sport. We had our, you know, our hot skins and our fanny packs and our T. Michael gear and going out in public like that. Thank God there were no pictures because. <laughs> I've, Got you bid. got a couple. I've seen you put a couple up from the old days. Yeah. <laughs> so an, another thing is, you know, the kids today, they're so aware of not only steroids, but pretty much every drug that's that's used in the sport today. I know drugs weren't as pervasive. There weren't as many of them, and they weren't used in such, you know, combinations back in the late 80s into the early 90s. But, you know, I myself was very naive. I had no concept that they were part of the sport. I looked at the pros and didn't understand, you know, aside from the genetics, I didn't understand why they were that big and I was so small. It took me until I was in California in 91 to really start seeing uh, what part they played. 
when did you how did you eventually figure out that they they played a role in the sport that they do you know i trained totally natural from when i started 15 to i think like 20 year the year that i won the ohio was the first time i'd ever took anything yeah. um and back then like you said it wasn't talked about but when muscle media came out that changed the world yeah, yeah. you know um even I just thought they were natural. I just thought they trained hard, they took their weed or supplements, and they grew. Right. And I think being that naive, it wasn't, I look at it and back at it now, it was kind of cool because you didn't know all this crazy stuff that's involved in the sport then and now. Um, but I got to Toledo, Ohio in college, and that's when my whole world changed. That was one of the best bodybuilding communities I've ever been around. And that's when you start seeing guys in the gym. I'm thinking, I'm training naturally. This guy put on 17 pounds in six weeks. Yeah. You know, what the hell's going on? You know, so once I got to Toledo, I did the my first NPC open show clean, and I won. And then it was kind of like you do a little, a little you know, a primo test, you know, one cc a week. I put on 16 pounds in like 10 weeks. Nice. And it was, it was noticeable. Like, people noticed, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it wasn't really talked about. You had to know a guy that knew a guy that knew a guy. And by the time it got to you, it was like 20 bucks an app because everybody, you know, stepped on it. Yeah, tax you yeah. for it but it, even back then ron it wasn't you weren't even seeing those mega cycles it wasn't crazy 2000 milligram and gh because gh was like the holy grail back then you, yeah. you heard about it you didn't really know where to get it maybe one guy had it, it was like 1200 dollars. yeah you know and in college i'm like that's just not even even an option it's not an option you know yeah. but it's just that that side of the sport, man. It's just it's one of those things where it's a part of the sport, and you have to be careful what you do. Once you start, once you go on that path, there's not really anything coming back. Right. You know, you're you're you have to do stuff to protect your body. You got to do the HCG after you're done and all that post cycle stuff. Yeah. So it was, and I never did a lot of stuff. I I never have. I never wanted to. Um, I hate taking shit. To be honest with you, man, I really do. I just. I'm not a fan of that. I hate feeling like a pin cushion, you know, and I probably why it's taking me so long to get the size I am because I never have pushed the envelope, you know. So um, it's part of the sport. I'll never, you know, be, you know, five, six, two thirty on stage. That's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? But I'm content where I'm at now. You know, I'm content with the size I'm have. If I place top, you know, be 10 at the, at the USA or Nationals, Top 15, I'm ecstatic. I'm walking away doing backflips, bro. You know what I mean? So it was just, like I said, muscle media came out, and you heard and read all this stuff, and the anabolic reference guide was so huge to us. We passed that book around like it was a Bible, man, and yeah. it opened my eyes to what was really going on back then. You know what I mean? And I don't know. It's just one of those parts of the sport that it, it is what it is, you know, and Contrary to what some people on the boards think, you're not a drug addict by taking this or doing this. You know what I mean? It's just, it's you do what you do to win. Every sport does it. Football, if you think those guys are 6'5", 300 pounds, winning 40 yards in <laughs> seconds, you're naive. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're just a naive guy. You know what I mean? It, it, in baseball, it came to light. All those guys were taking that, you know? Yeah. Six dick long ball. And we know why they dug the long ball, because they were all jacked, you know? So, so you know, the – We've seen this with the younger generation, and now that there's so much info available about drugs and it's, there's so much discussion about it, that obviously what, what me and you complain about is that they think it's all drugs. You know, We use that phrase, the finishing touch, because in the old days, like I said, it wasn't talked about. Mm -hmm. Guys used moderate amounts, but it was on top of hard training, good eating, resting, and all that, whereas now... You know, there's a, there's this prevailing attitude, unfortunately, that even genetics don't matter, which is preposterous, and they think they can make up for not only lackluster training and eating, but crap genetics by just mm -hmm. taking tons and tons and tons of crap. Does it does it bother you to see that attitude and so many people deluded? It's Boston Lloyd's fault. <laughs> that idiot. Here's the thing: if genetics didn't matter, yeah. And all it was the drugs. He would be Mr. Olympia. Yeah. He, but he's not. And I think people like that, man, it just gives people a false idea of what's going on. You can't take drugs to make up for shitty genetics. Yeah. It won't work. If you if you don't have the genetics, the discipline, 
those guys are mentally are mental freaks, man. They are so driven, and their desire is so strong that you know, drugs help. Those guys blow up. They don't have to take a lot of stuff to get big. I don't think a lot of pros pound shit either. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm sure some do, but you can't make up for you know, drugs can't take over for hard work. It doesn't. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? If, if you work hard, you got good genetics, eat good, and take a little bit of something, you're gonna improve. But re people rely, and I think people think that because they their genetics suck, yes. that oh well, if I took what they did, I'd be just as big. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't, dude. Your genetics aren't that great. You know what I mean? And it's funny. And I don't. I'm not trying to call anybody out on the boards. I'm do. I'm doing my best not to. Yes. But there's a certain guy on there that just thinks it's all drugs, and I laugh at him. Because he's a 34-year-old man thinking all these guys take drugs. They all suck. They're all drug addicts. They're all got bloated guts. It's yeah. not how it is. These guys have so much muscle on them. It's, it's like we're going to the zoo and seeing a lion in person. You can't grasp how big that lion is until you see them. They have a lot of muscle. That's what it is, you know. And they bust ass. They work hard, you know. Brandon Curry went over to Kuwait, and it's, it's no magic pill. There's, no, there's nothing in the water. If you eat, sleep, and train, that's it. All day, no outside drama. You're gonna grow. Yeah. Now, Brandon's a genetic freak, so whatever he probably did just blew up. No stress. Kids got like five kids. That's a lot to do to prepare for a show. Yeah. But you can't. Re testosterone, Deca, trend is not gonna replace hard work. You know what I mean? And just with some people would kind of get that through their head that there's no there's no magic supplement or pill that makes Phil Hill great. Phil Heath had big arms playing Division One basketball. Yep. You can see that. Sean Ray was built like a grown-ass man at 19 years old. Yep. You right. knew Sean Ray, Eddie Robinson were going to be good at that young age. Even Branch Warren was a freak at 19 years old yep. because he's the gene they're the genetic elite. And at this sport, the genetic elite will always rise to the top, yep. no matter what. Any sport, you know what I mean? You don't see very many five, six pro basketball players. You know what I mean? I'm not in the, in the NFL. You know, I'm five, six. Yeah. Slow as hell, but it doesn't work that way. Every now and then, uh, you have a freak, you know, that gets through. But genetics determine everything, and people need to realize that. It's just it, like Bob said; it's not rocket surgery. You know, what I mean, people just need to like open their eyes and just realize that some of us have it, some of us don't. And once you realize where you fall in that genetic pecking order, you'll enjoy the sport a lot more. You know what I mean? So it's it's frustrating. And I just I don't like getting debates a lot about that because you can't argue it's stupid sometimes. You know what I mean? They they think everything's a conspiracy and yeah. it's all you know shows were predetermined. Blah blah blah. It's it's funny. You know what I mean? If, if shows were predetermined, Sean Ray would have been like five time Mr. Olympia. Gunnar would have won twenty times in a row. Sure. Thank you know what I mean? So it's not it's not that man. People just need to wake up sometimes. Uh, here's something I want you to give your opinion on. You know when we when we were following women's bodybuilding back in the late 80s, early 90s. I, I went to a few Ms. Olympias. They were sold out. The shows were held all on their own, different time of year, you know, a month, month or two before, after the Olympia, totally different city. It was very popular. And, you know, as the decade went on, the 90s, women's bodybuilding really fell off. And now, really, it's, it's hanging on by a thread. There's almost no, there almost is no women's, but there's no Ms. Olympia contest anymore. Women's physique is sort of taking the place. You know, you're, you were a... You were a female bodybuilding fan as well. What do you think? What do you think happened to the sport that that took it off the radar the way it went? It's hard to say because it's out here. Let me think. Sandy Rydell came into the one the eighty nine Olympia huge and shredded, big. She pushed Corey really hard, and from that show, it just snowballed. The girls got bigger and bigger and harder and harder, and women's bodybuilding is a niche sport more so than men's bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. You know. We know there's, you know, kind of a shady underworld to female bodybuilding that, that's around. But the, the fan base just, I think, just couldn't take it anymore. They were just getting bigger and bigger. And, look, you either like female bodybuilding or you don't. There's no in-between. And I think a lot of guys, for whatever reason, think muscles on a girl are gross. I love it, man. I've been a fan since day one, <laughs> since Tanya Knight, you know what I mean, Donna Oliveira, those girls. Yeah. That was my thing. I, I remember watching the Women's Pro World from France back in 88, dude. You know what I mean? It was just, it was an event. The Miss Olympia was an event. Yeah. 
the fact that it's gone is like a slap in the face of these women. They work hard as we do. The prize money wasn't there, and it's just there's so, there's zero opportunities. I'm um, thank God for Tim Gardner because if it wasn't for him, there would be no women's bodybuilding anymore. It would just be extinct. But I don't know what they're going to do because they're still giving pro cards out to the, the girls at Nationals in the USA with very limited opportunity. Right. Um, I think eventually it's going to be gone, to tell you the truth, yeah. which sucks. But I think you also got to realize that women's physique, the girls are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and harder and harder. If they don't slow this down, it's going to be the exact same thing as it was with women's bodybuilding. Yeah. I think women's physique was meant not to be huge and shredded. But if you look at the girls, you know, oh, they look phenomenal. Man. They look great. Shanine Grant is just like the bee's knees, man. That girl is just phenomenal. I love that chick. But it's getting out of hand. The condition on these girls is getting out of hand, and you're going to be in the exact same spot you were. But, you know, women's bodybuilding was – you can tell when you put a picture of a women's bodybuilder on, online, the comments are just disgusting. You know what I mean? They're just – they're rude. You know what I mean? Very disrespectful. Yeah. Very disrespectful. But you know, I think the girls that they, they too, you don't, you don't get in the sport women's bodybuilding for, for act, you know, just for money. You get into because you love it, like we do. Yeah. We love the sport, and they love the sport, man. But it just sucks that their opportunities are gone. I mean, when I got rid of the Mr. International. It was just like, kind of slapping the face of those girls. You know what I mean? They've had the Mr. International for how long? You know, just, you know, the list of women that won that show was impressive as hell. And not having a Miss Olympia, he has pole fitness. You know what I mean? Pole fitness is at the Arnold Classic now. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's, it's, ping, it's, ping pong was actually, table tennis was at the Arnold this year as one of the events. I don't even, you know what I mean? I don't get it. I just, uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> right, I'm old and cranky, dude, like you. And just, I just don't understand it. I guess, I don't know. I, if I want to see a pole fitness, I'll go to a strip club. I won't go to the Arnold Classic. That's where I'll see it. But it's just, I don't know, it's whatever brings in the money. But my thing was that women's bodybuilding was attached to a pro show, to the Olympia, to the Arnold. You know, so I don't get the whole financial, how they're not making money from sponsors. Or sponsors want to sponsor, you know, yeah. the men's show, not the women. But me, a guy in board shorts at the Olympia. How many sponsors want to do that? So Somebody else. Somebody must be sponsoring it. I don't, know. Dude, I don't get it. I don't understand board shorts, but what do I know? Brief comment, if you would. Um, <laughs> marijuana is becoming legal in, I, I predict in 10 to 15 years, it's going to be legal in every state in the U.S. Uh, my state, Massachusetts, we just legalized it last uh, election, November, a few other states. Why do you think there's still such a stigma compared to like alcohol and nicotine, things like that, where it's clear that the people of the USA, by and large, don't really look down on as much as the legislators would have us want to believe. Why do you think there's still that huge stigma around marijuana as a recreational drug, as opposed to something like alcohol? Like you're 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 a bad person if you smoke pot. You, there's nothing wrong with you if you drink a quart of vodka every night. Straight cash, homie. Straight <laughs> cash. If you look at a football game, how many beer commercials do you see? Several. See those commercials, they're laughing, they're joking. It looks like a great time. Yeah. You don't see those people puking and fighting and getting into accidents and getting DUIs. Yeah. Society has a – it's just a social stigma. It really is. And it's its sad in a way because alcohol kills so many people. Dude, there's seriously – there's so many one-way accidents in Florida. It's almost like one every weekend. It's ridiculous. Wow. How many one-way accidents we have because of alcohol? Hmm. And for, as far as nicotine, you have all those lobbyists in D.C. that lobby to keep, keep the tobacco legal. Tobacco is disgusting. It kills. It says on the pack, it will kill you. Yes. You will die from smoking this. Yes. Nobody that smokes lives to be 85, 90 years old without a trach or some kind of problem. Yeah. But people, I don't know. It's just it's. Marijuana, for some reason, I think all those old guys in Washington, man, are just, they're old. Mm -hmm. They're old men, and they love their alcohol, they love their cigarettes, but God forbid if you smoke a joint, you know what I mean, you're a menace of society. But it's good to see a lot of the laws changing um, for having just a little bit of weed or, you know, you get a ticket, it's a citation. In Tampa, you get a citation for anything think, under a gram, oh. which is good. Because, but, I don't know, they passed the medical marijuana law down here, but they're still screwing around with it. It's for just really debilitating injuries, so I don't have any of those, so I still got to go to my dude. <laughs> All 
uh, I want to want to talk about your plans now. You know, you you talk about these guys with great genetics, and you you know, I don't think you have Phil Heath genetics, but your genetics are definitely uh, a few steps above your average meathead that I know for sure. Uh, you're you're going about two forty in the off season at five six most of the time. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, and you diet down to one ninety eight for your show. It was one ninety four on my last show. Okay. So that's that's a lot of muscle because you're a small. You don't seem to have very thick joints. You're a small bone yeah. guy. That that's a lot of muscle mass. Uh, no real weak body parts that I can think of. Looking at your pictures, so uh, what is your next show? I I know Goon was talking about helping you prep for something. Is it going to be Team U or what are you going to do? I'm actually going to do the Southeast uh, USA in Orlando. Yeah. Um, I, my problem Ron, is confidence. I feel like I always look like crap. Um, I think, honestly, when I did that USA in 98, it opened my eyes to how good these guys are in competition. Yeah. Like I told you before, like I had Tito Raymond was in my class, Steve Cantone, uh, Patrick Masuda, all those guys, and you saw how good they were. Yeah. It's just confidence, man. I just, I'm a mental case before a show. I'm neurotic. I'm looking in the mirror every five minutes. But I've always done my own thing, and it's worked out. Yeah. Um, I just think this time I just have to diet slow and just follow the plan and not stress out. And But for me, it's about condition. I have to be in condition. I think I was in decent condition two years ago. I wasn't in great condition. I got to get those glutes and hams in. You know, yeah. Unfortunately, it's the glute and ham show now. Yeah. This is what – if your glutes aren't in, you're, you're off, right. which isn't always the case, but it is the case. So I – you know, I just need some little bit more confidence and belief in myself that I can do it. Um, I love bodybuilding. I love competing. I hate dieting. Let me put that out there. I despise dieting. Who does it, man? Who does it? You know, <laughs> I love my balls, and I just – I like to eat. Yeah. But I know that at my age, my window is getting smaller and smaller, well, and I can't see, do this forever. Let me forever. stop you right there. You're 41, 42? How old are you? 43. 43. Why would, why would you not do Team U Masters, Masters Nationals, Masters at North American? Until I get my condition down 100%, I have to pass on that. I want to use the show in October to see how good shape I come in. I can't leave. Masters Nationals, man, those guys are insane. I'd argue those guys are more conditioned than guys at the USA are. They're peeled. They got old man muscle, dude. They're shredded. They're hard. They're dry. And I need to get that combination down before I make that next step. I think if all goes well this year, I get the timing down, I figure it out. From here on out, it's just a national show. Yeah. Because that's been my um, Achilles heel, my, my weakness is national shows. Yeah. Um, I said before, I went as a fan in 98. And when you go as a fan, you're overwhelmed by the experience, man. It was nuts. So I have to go in with the mindset of I'm going in to do well. I'm going in to place. Yeah. You know, but it's – those guys, it's a deep show. Those guys are awesome. They're really awesome. Let me say this, too. Chris has given me a lot of good advice. Yeah. Dude knows his shit, man. Like, I text him back and forth with some bounce ideas off of him, and he's got it, he got it down pretty well, you know, and he's always saying, you know, might as well do the Nationals, just do it, just do it. So yeah. we'll see. I want to, but you know what? That's a lot of money, too, dude. That, that entry fee is insane, and I don't want to be that guy on MD that Sean Ray says, not ready for Nationals. You know what I mean? In the play-by-play. Play. Well, let me let me help your confidence here if I can because I've done a few national shows as a Masters now. And for the most part, the majority of guys who do these Masters national shows, 40 and over, uh, I think they fall into the same category as me where we're, we're pretty good. We're not great. We don't have great genetics. We just work really hard and we diet really hard and this and that. But there's not many guys at that level with your type of genetics. Most of them – They've either already turned pro by that point or they've given up on bodybuilding and competing many years ago. You don't see that many guys with the really good genetics, and I put you in that category at the master's level. So I personally feel if you could whip yourself into that really, really crisp condition, hit a national master's show, you are definitely in the running for a pro card. Listen, man, he hearing you say that is means a lot because, you know, you know your shit, really. Yeah. You've been in my own sport for a long time, so – it's, it's on the table, put it that way. You know what I mean? It's on the table. Um, I'm eating clean now, cleaning my diet up, which is my biggest hurdle because, like I said, I'm a sugar freak, man. I love my cookies. I love my Waffle House. Yeah. But I'm slowly cutting that stuff out. And you, you feel better when you don't eat crap every single day. So 
you'll see me on national stage this year, hopefully. Knock on wood. We'll see me on the national stage this year. So that's the plan. But I just want to get back on stage, man. I just I miss that. I miss you walking in, you smell the pro tan, you see all the sunken faces, you know, see the bikini girls carving up for some reason. <laughs> Who knows, man? Pumping nope, not, yeah. No, not any bikini girls. I love those girls. Of course, of course. Of course. Um, all right, man. This is uh, this has been really cool to finally talk to you. Finally, get to know the man behind all these posts, all these years. Uh, I've seen a couple pictures, but this is uh, so much better. I think Definitely. people are really going to enjoy getting to know you a little bit better and hearing your opinions that uh, you were good enough to share with us. Dude, so, this is this is unreal. I appreciate the opportunity, Ron. I really do, man. No for real. So for MD and the Ron Line Report, this has been Ron Harris with Big Mike Cox. Talk to you later. Peace out. <laughs>